Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to The Orbit. Today we have Melissa Blunt. Melissa, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. How are you, Connor? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, why don't you tell awesome. us a little bit about yourself? All right. Um, I'm a middle school librarian in Portland, Oregon uh, at a Title I school, and I am currently uh, on quarantine leave or whatever until the end of this school year, and we'll see what happens in the fall. Uh, remind me what Title I is. Uh, Title I has to do, it's like a federal designation, and I don't know the exact percentages, but it has to do with what percentage of students um, are eligible for free and reduced lunch. So essentially, it's a low-income school. Got it. Um, and so, so at my school, we actually have community eligibility, which means every student gets free breakfast, lunch, and a snack every day because enough people in the zip code for the school are on some form of like government assistance. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's really great. What did your job kind of look like two months ago? Um, hectic, noisy. My coworker says we have like the noisiest librarian in Port or library in Portland. The maybe the noisiest librarian too. <laughs> let's be honest. Um, so it's it's always full of kids. We have students coming through like all hours of the day um, for books, computer use, uh, snacks, cups for water, uh, just making like using our kitchen area, anything that you can imagine. Uh, safety pins, we're just kind of like the catch all, what do you need kind of people for our school. And there's a few other people like that. Like we do have social workers in the building um, and counselors and other folks that are trying to help kids meet needs, but we also offer like information needs. So books, uh, internet resources, help with homework, stuff like that. What drew you to the library position? Um, I, right out of college, way back in 2005, I uh, had an English degree and I was sort of like, oh, uh, can't really get a job with an English degree, huh? It's kind of tough. So I um, did some things to get certified to be a teacher in Florida at that time and I taught eighth grade English and history for about six years and uh, in middle school typically an English teacher is the person responsible for taking their class to the library for book checkout time in elementary school it's like every class goes you know once or twice a week but in middle school it's all up to the English teacher to make sure kids have access to independent reading materials so I did that every other week and I that was like my favorite part of my job um, and, it, and I remembered, oh, I actually had worked in a public library in high school, my first like summer job. And then I worked in the library in college uh, as like a library assistant doing work study. So I had kind of the qualifications in the background. So I just tested into a certification for school library position. I did that for a couple of years um, before I became a stay at home mom. And then when I moved to Portland, um, once my son started preschool, I worked on my master's. So now I have a master's in library and information science. Very cool. Yeah. Long time coming, it seems. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've been, so I'm 36 and I, my first library job I got when I was 15. Um, so it's definitely been a trajectory. And actually my great aunt was a school librarian. And for some reason, I didn't know that was a career path I could take. Uh, but she really was a big inspiration to me and she's still around. So cool. thankful for her. Uh, yeah, but I, it does feel like I've finally kind of reached my, my stride for what I would like to do with my life. I call it my dream job and it's true. I really love what I do and I love my students and my staff. How has that changed in the past month? Oh, um, <laughs> like, well, tell me a little bit about, uh, the timeline. Like how did it, um, how did it happen? Um, we all started to be a little aware and like nervous in the beginning of March 2020 for reference. And uh, then sometime like the first or second week of March, I started to realize that I was going to need to be a little more conscious of like doing some sanitizing at school, having sanitizer available for students. Uh, getting like, you know, little Clorox wipes and stuff and supplying that for my library and for uh, I teach an elective sometimes. So for that classroom 
And then um, I started to have some concerns about coworkers. Like my closest coworker in the library has a dad who's in his 90s and is in like an assisted living facility. And so I was a little worried and I was getting ready to tell her she should plan to take the next week off when that like late that Thursday night on March 12th, we heard that the governor was going to be canceling school for a couple of weeks. Um, and it came the week before spring break. So we weren't really sure what was going to happen after spring break. We just knew we were gonna have a longer spring break. And so we didn't really, none of us, I feel like did enough to be proactive at that point to kind of get ready for what was going to happen next. Um, and then once we were already into that two week period, they pushed school out till like April 28th, I believe. And then just this week, they announced that we would not be going back the school year. So I've been out of contact with most of my students. Yes. So we're, I mean, I think Washington, California, I don't know how many states, but at least on the West Coast, I believe Washington and California announced on Monday that they would not be going back to school this year. And then wow. Oregon announced on Wednesday. So yeah, it's changed a lot. What? Um, so are you and your school still operating as a school? Uh, I guess that's where we get into the semantics of what is a school and what does a school do Great. and what does a school offer to their community. Um, and there's also like the micro and macro of there's a local neighborhood school, there's a school district that oversees schools in a certain area, and then there is the state department of education. So all of those layers are kind of coming into play. Um, with the governor directly like being over the Department of Education for Oregon. So no, not really. As I was saying, I've, I've like been out of touch with most of my students for a month now nearly, which is really hard. I have 450 students and 30 to 50 staff, and I try to know every name and like keep an idea of what kind of books they like and you know what's going on with their lives, and that's been sort of tough to feel cut off from them. Um, we are still, our school district is offering meals on site at a lot of the schools, especially in the lower income neighborhoods. So um, I know that my students are at least getting food uh, five days a week. And then recently they've been trying to get technology out to the students. So that's been a barrier. The state and other states have, their response to this has been to go to online learning or distance learning. Um, and that's all well and good. And I feel pretty comfortable with distance learning. I did my master's degree online um, and I teach a tech elective. So I know all the tools that we have available. But when your students don't have access to technology or Wi-Fi, because they may have a device, but they might not have internet access, um, it doesn't really matter. Like all of those best laid plans and intentions are moot. And so it's been kind of a, do you swear on this podcast? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, it's Often. been sort of a clusterfuck trying to get computers in the hands of our, especially our most vulnerable students here in Portland. Um, and it actually made the news yesterday. There were lines about three hours long um, at all the schools where they had like open access to just come and uh, sign out a computer. They had lines three hours long and they had to turn people away because they ran out. And these are like Chromebooks. And how are you solving the Wi-Fi problem? Are they still, are they connected to the internet or no? There are some low income programs that have already been in existence and are maybe being expanded a bit. So Comcast has one called Internet Essentials. And then Spectrum, I think, is the other. Um, but that's not he here locally in Portland. Um, I believe Xfinity is opening up all their hotspots so that you don't have to have a password to get in anymore. And the district's been asking people to open up their personal networks so that they're accessible. They do have some hotspots available, but they don't have enough for every student. The estimates I've seen, and it, it's nationally, so it's obviously going to vary by zip code um, primarily, but like 50% of students don't have internet access at home in, in our country. And so Jeez. If, you're looking, if you're looking at a neighborhood that already has a lot of disadvantages, it's probably more like 70 to 80%. Um, don't have internet access at home. So they may have a mobile phone and they might have a da data plan of some sort and that might even be limited, but they they don't have enough broadband for like video conferencing or other things like that. 
it almost seems like it's hard to uh, think about teaching right now when the first step is just access. <laughs> yeah, so last night my teacher union, which is generally pretty great, um, sent out a survey and it asked a lot of questions about what, you know, what do you think we should have been doing differently or what can we do now to improve equity for our students? And they also asked us some interesting questions about like, what's your home situation? How are you coping and are you able to really offer much to your students at this point? Um, but yes, my feeling is that the week, the first week we're out of school, we shouldn't have been so short-sighted and we should have been trying to get technology in the hands of students right then and there. Um, or ideally, if we could time travel, um, schools should just plan to be one-to-one -one with technology, with Chromebooks. They're not that expensive. They are probably- I can speak like, from experience. A Chromebook is the cost of maybe four textbooks. So if you're thinking math, English, science, and social studies or history, that's four textbooks right there. So rather than doing that, we should have internet access and a Chromebook for every student in the country. That would be the ideal. Um, and then and then this would have been a little bit less of a hurdle. But yeah, without that in place, we've been expected to kind of start touching base with students this week. And then next week, the state is mandating that we start what they're calling distance learning for all. Um, but when I know that, again, like 60 to 80% of my students don't have access, is it really learning for all? I don't really feel like that. So I would have preferred that our efforts go into getting access first and foremost, and then working on academics. But there's also a case to be made for the social emotional state of students and their basic needs like food, housing, um, other things like that that really need to be prioritized. So what uh, like are you or is your community doing on an individual level to address this? Like, is there any solutions on the horizon? Um, it's it's hard, this gets kind of philosophical, but to work within a very flawed system like the public school system here in Portland and even like on a national level, I believe our public school system is really flawed. So it's hard to work within that and also um, work around it a lot. <laughs> um, so I know that my district is not doing things the way I think uh, they should or, or being very equitable. So highlighting that in a way that is um, challenging hopefully to the leadership to try to do better and be more equitable and more fair to these students that have the most disadvantage um, is one way that I've gone about it. Uh, I know Portland has a lot of amazing mutual aid work going on. Um, so highlighting those, uh, participating in those, donating to people either on an individual basis, person to person, or to like a greater mutual aid kind of network that folks can access and then making sure that people who need it know what resources are available. Um, the State Teachers Union made uh, grants available. They always have these grants available, but they've kind of expanded the qualifications a little bit and made it a little easier. So yesterday I spent an hour or two applying for $100 grants for 20 of my students who are undocumented and won't be receiving any of the federal aid that folks are expecting. Um, and I was kind of brainstorming before this, but I think I'm going to ask friends at least to consider donating a portion of their check when they do receive that federal aid to the people who are being left out, um, which includes like undocumented folks and also uh, sex workers are not receiving any uh, federal aid from that CARES Act. Yeah, I would love to get that list from you after the interview of like these organizations. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, I have a couple good articles I can send you cool. to promote. And there's some cool. things going on na uh, nationally, and then there's also, like, it's very local, too. So I would try to get involved with whatever's happening in your own, like, city and state to find out what these networks are, which nonprofits are kind of trying to help the folks that are being left out and that are in the gap there, whether it's technology access or, you know, basic needs like food and housing. Um. Yeah, this access problem is huge. With it going on, have you been doing any teaching still? Um, so the role of a teacher librarian is pretty misunderstood, I think, mm -hmm. because we teach students, but we also do a lot of one-on-one -on -one 
work with students, helping them find tailored resources, books, websites, uh, things like that. And we also teach our staff um, what's out there, how to access it, the legalities of like copyright and things like that, which have been a big kind of a thing to be aware of right now where people are trying to make everything digital and like what are the legal boundaries of that and how do we do that in a way that's fair to authors and creators and stuff but still helps meet this need that during this like emergency level um yeah so no not really uh <laughs> to answer short the short version i've done uh two google hangouts so far with my students and i've posted them and i've had the first time i had two kids come for a little while and then i had a uh, they invited two more friends who I do, they're all in my elective class. So I'm starting there. And then I did it again on Wednesday and I think I had more like 10 kids by the end. Um, and I'm gonna do it today and I'm gonna host a Kahoot. So if you've never played a Kahoot, it's like a quiz game online and you can all sign in and like play together. So we're gonna try to do a Kahoot on Google Hangouts today. And I hope that I'm teaching them something, but ultimately, it's about meeting that social emotional need and just being reminding them that I still am there for them and I'm a resource to them. And then I taught my teachers um, a little bit last week. We did a lot of professional development about Google Classroom, Google Hangouts, things like that. So just knowing that I'm comfortable with those, I was able to help folks out a little bit. And then I taught them about Flipgrid, which is a kind of like a Marco Polo type thing, but for education. So it meets all the privacy requirements and you can like leave video messages and re reply to each other and stuff. So we made a um, video about just saying, saying that we missed our students, sending them little messages from each of the teachers. Um, so I worked on that and helped get that set up, taught the teachers how to do it and edited like the compilation of all their videos this week. Yeah. Do you know um, like the general sentiment of students from your school, like how they feel about this whole scenario? When I posted on Monday that we were going to have a Google Hangout, one student said, why are you doing this to us, Miss B? We're on a break. And so she's kind of, she's just kind of a funny person. And so that's her perception of things is that we're on a break. Um, I think Wednesday, I talked to them kind of right as we were finding out that we wouldn't be going back. And they were just kind of like absorbing that. So I think today I'll hear more. Um, but I do think there's some grief going on. There's also like just feeling isolated from friends while we all are pretty comfortable connecting online. Um, kids that are used to being in a room with 20 or 30 other people their age, you know, six to eight hours a day, it's kind of a big shock. So even my kid who's an only child was like really missing school. And, you know, I'd say, oh, you're gonna see all your friends on, on Google Hangouts later. And it's just not the same. Um, but then thinking about like high school seniors um, who are missing out on prom and graduation and all of those sort of things. And then also like my eighth graders, we'd been working on a yearbook. And so are we going to still have a yearbook? I'm not really sure what we're going to do with that. And we won't be having promotions. So will we try to do some sort of video or digital like promotion ceremony? I don't know. It's going to be an interesting couple of months. Have you seen any uh, like creative solutions or any like innovations from anyone? Um, I think it's still pretty new here, but I have seen some things that were going on in Asia uh, when this was first kind of starting a few months ago. So there was like, a, uh, I think it was Roblox or Minecraft, one or the other, they did like a Roblox um, graduation ceremony where everybody like kind of signed in and then they walked across the stage. I also saw like a library, a big library that was built on Minecraft that folks could go and access books through Minecraft. <laughs> so um, there's also, <laughs> yeah, I posted about it on, so my library has an Instagram and I posted about it there. And I would say if I am doing any teaching, it's probably through my Instagram because I try to just point kids in the direction of, of something that they might have you know, an interest in or, or be able to follow through on on their own. Um, there was something else that was kind of funny. Yeah, it's gone now. But I do think there have been some creative solutions. And I think that we'll probably see more, especially as America kind of copes with what this means for end of the end of the school year. And I've seen some great posts and thoughts from other 
educators. But one thing is like, this is kind of the sweet spot of the school year. Spring comes and the kids may get a little squirrely, but at that point you've known each other for a while. And this is really when like you have the fun and you make the memories. So I think that's been sort of difficult. So figuring out how we do that. Um, my creative solution is to use the snap camera filters in my Google Hangout. So I just turn myself into a potato or like whatever to try to get them to laugh and give, you know, show them some, some levity in their day, hopefully. Um, and of course the memes, the kids are so good with their memes. They're just like God level. Yeah. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're out there. <sighs> um, as a like parent, how are you uh, like navigating schooling for your kid? Yeah, so that was my union survey I did last night, asked a few questions that just kind of made me laugh because I feel like I've been really fortunate. I'm still, I mean, compared to a lot of people my age, um, I'm still getting a paycheck, I can pay my rent, I have health insurance, I have plenty of food in my house, and like not everyone can say that right now, and I, and I fully recognize that. But then when I was filling out the survey, I was like, oh my God, maybe I have it worse than I thought. Because it was like, um, are you taking care of a child while you're working it from home? And I was like, oh, yes, I am. Uh, has your partner bit like lost work due to this crisis? Uh, yes, yes, he has. Um, is anyone in your house sick? Uh, yes, two out of three of us have had a fever the past two weeks. And like, I have kind of a bad cough. So I probably have whatever this COVID thing is, but I'm, mm. I know that testing is not really super widely available, and I also haven't had a, any trouble breathing or anything like that where I would feel like I need medical attention. So just um, knowing that I'm not doing my best work right now on so many levels is really difficult for me because I do recognize that my students have a lot of disadvantages, and I try to make up for that by just working my ass off for them. Um, so knowing that like I'm sick, I'm distracted, I'm trying to help my own fourth grader keep his like math and writing skills where they should be and up to par and also keep him from just like rotting away in front of YouTube for eight hours a day. Um, or he's really been in a king of the hill, which is probably not child appropriate, but it's better than some things he could be watching. So <laughs> he's learning a lot. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> Um, if you could, like, this seems, I just I want to know what the best case scenario would look like if you were able to, like, wave a magic wand and put things into place to, like, respond appropriately. What would that look like right now? Um, on so many levels, I think being more prepared and having more time is the best thing that I could wish for um, on the level of like federal preparedness for a pandemic and the medical issues that are arising out of it, but also um, digital learning and students having devices, having internet, if that was already in place um, and if they were comfortable using those tools independently and teachers were comfortable using them, we would be weeks ahead of where we are right now. Um, so I think just knowing that we are losing so much time um, at this point. I will say that academically, um, I at least we're all going to be a little behind uh, whatever the curve is um, of learning. So when folks are concerned about their student falling behind, myself included, I try to tell myself this, it's, you know, we're all, we're all in the same boat for the most part, at least in our country. Um, and we're already behind many other countries in the world in a lot of ways. So um, we're all kind of pressing pause on what that learning looks like. And I think it, we have to at some point say that's okay because we're all kind of going through a traumatic situation too. And so we're not going to be doing our best learning. We're not really in a headspace where we can self-actualize or like be super concerned with that. And that needs to be okay for everybody. Um, so you don't have to write King Lear while you're home, just in case you're thinking about it. <laughs> yes, I, um, I, I've been advocating to everyone. I was like, hey, you don't have to be productive. <laughs> I'm trying to do a little bit of that, but yeah, I also have to recognize that working my ass off is not gonna fix this situation. It probably doesn't fix any situation, but at least it makes me feel better sometimes. Um, and the other thing I would wish for, other than more time, is just 
the knowledge that my students are safe and they have what they need. Um, because a lot of students, I again would need to look up percentages, but I heard in New York, it was like something like 40,000 students in New York schools are homeless in one way or another, whether that means they're couch surfing or living in a shelter um, or crammed into an apartment with multiple families or something like that. But knowing that my students have their basic needs met would help me um, move forward into that like academic learning space. Yeah. Um, and also their social emotional needs. So knowing that they're not living in trauma um, beyond what we all are right now, but that you know, their homes are safe for them and they're not you know, facing bullying or abuse of any kind and they have food and- The basics. The basics, right. Yeah. So if I could wave a wand and say, Everybody, and also think about the, the stress of parents knowing that they, you know, have lost income, can't pay rent, might not have access to food, and there's a feeling that food banks and those kind of things may eventually run out. Um, you know, that is not good for a parent's mindset, and so then that does tend to impact your children, whether, right. you, whether you are dealing with it on your own terms in a healthy way or not, it's going to impact your family somewhat, and so there's probably, I'm sure there has been a rise in a lot of um, mental and physical abuse in homes. So just knowing that our basic needs are met and we don't have that stress. If we had a social safety net, oh my God, then at least, you know, we could say while our students are at home, they're safe and they're well-fed and they're cared for. And then we could ask them to do something beyond the minimum. To go back to, uh just like your school and education um, system. What have educators had the most trouble as far as like doing distance learning? I don't know if I can be nice about this. Because uh -huh. <laughs> I, um, educators are amazing people and they put in so much time and effort, um, but they also have a lot of new mandates and jargon thrown at them every year or maybe even less every six months um, and there's always been such a focus on testing and data and I don't feel like we've prioritized keeping up with things technologically so I would say most school systems are a good 10 years behind the corporate world when it comes to their comfort with using technology so um, that <laughs> Do you have any like common uh, questions uh, that people encounter in terms of just like basic literacy on um, the internet? Well, well, for my students, it's really kind of scary and sad, but a lot of families don't know how to have them sign into the Chromebook once they have the Chromebook. So that's like the most basic skill that I feel like a kindergartner should be expected to master. And there really aren't, like Common Core standards do not include technology or information standards. So that's one reason that libraries are um, among the first to face like staffing cuts because there's no expectation of uh, like skills for each grade level for students. And I think if we embedded those for students, teachers would have to rise to the occasion. Um, there's also a really big age span, so not to get all like anti-boomer um, at this juncture, but the older uh, an educator is, the less comfort they have. So I've had people asking me how to share things on Google Drive, um, how to like move files from their desktop to another place on their computer, all, ki all kinds of things. Um, email etiquette is generally pretty terrible with educators. And I get it because we're really busy, especially when we are in a physical school building. It's so hard to have a quiet minute alone at your computer, but um, just things like that in the corporate world would not fly at all. <laughs> I know that like my personal experience is that it's not all like older people, that some people manage to have these computer literacy skills um, and others don't. What do you know, like, do you witness or have a theory as to why some older people can do this and some can't? Um, I think there's something to say for 
uh, like elasticity of the brain and just mm-hmm. like being open to trying new things and failing and, and that um, mindset of growth that you don't have to like, if it's hard and you fail, it's not the end of the world. You know what I mean? And so just a willingness to try new things tends to be a good indicator that someone's going to at least be able to teach themselves how to use a new technological tool. Um, And I'm sure that access is part of it as well. So going back to like what students have access to, students can, kids, like teenagers, middle schoolers can do amazing things on a cell phone um, that I can't do, but that's because that's what they have. That's what they have access to. And so, um, yeah, they, they impress me all the time with things that they can do that I can't do, despite like actively trying to learn and be on top of technology as much as I can. Can you give so, me an example? Ah, I wish I could. Like, I don't have a Snapchat. I've thought about it. I'm just like, it's, I don't get it, man. And then TikTok, like, I don't, when I watch TikToks, I'm just like, how did they do that? Like, I know how to do some video editing, but I don't, I don't know how people do these things. They're just so creative and it seems to take a lot of technical skill. Maybe I'm wrong, but I guess I should try it and figure it out. I, I recommend it. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll consider it. Great. Is there anything <laughs> else you'd like to uh, conclude with? Um, Let us know. Just, yeah, if you're, if you're a parent, please know that your student is not going to fall behind any more than anyone else's. And if your student already has access to technology and their teacher and any kind of new academic concepts, they are way ahead of a lot of other students in America. So please don't think that you um, are representative of most families in America, because most families in America, or at least half, don't have those privileges and that access. Um, And so we all, the people who do, we need to advocate for those families that don't and try to find ways to put them first as much as we can. And if you're a college student, oh my God, don't let anybody stress you out right now. There's so much to worry about. And hopefully your schools and your professors are being very graceful and understanding and like helping you just manage um, to get through the semester. Right. Yeah. Um, If you're a teacher, dude call me find some self-care I don't know how I'm having tea and playing Animal Crossing uh, a little bit here and there so that's my that's my self-care regimen um, and if you are you know home because you're out of work right now you're furloughed or um, have been laid off I would say reach out to mutual aid networks find some groups in your area because there is a lot of good work going on and even if you um, just need to access that and get aid for yourself that's okay but if you have the free time there may be needs that you can help me in your time even if you don't have like financial resources to contribute um because there's there's a lot that we all need to do together to help each other out so yeah great that's it thank you so much for coming on melissa it is thanks, thanks for having me great to like basically get inside into a world that i'm generally distanced from so it's really important and I'm really grateful to hear what's going on on your end. I so appreciate your curiosity because I think that's probably the one thing people who don't have kids in public school um, or aren't educators it's easy to sort of ignore what's going on there but I do feel like it really impacts society as a whole so we just need to be curious about how other people are living out there so thanks for that. Yeah. Great well that concludes our interview thank you so much Melissa. Awesome thanks Connie.